Today's show is sponsored by Yaffa Bay and her Spirit of Tepereth Metaphysical Marketplace, here to provide you and your naturally special gifts with guidance and support through your life's journey. Providing you tools such as candles, incense, charms, jewelry, oils, crystals, and much more. Visit them at 1273 West Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio, or online at spiritoftepereth.com. You can find all our sponsors' information in the show notes on our website. Now let's start the show. Welcome to the Articles of ADOS podcast, a weekly show where we bring you undiscussed news, articles, and information important to the American descendants of slavery, our friends, and our allies. You can find us every Friday, 10 a.m. on WCRS 92.7, 98.3 here in Columbus, Ohio, or listen on your favorite podcast app. This is episode 24. I'm your host, Lisa Todd, along with my co-host, Daoud Giazan. On today's show, we will share articles from ProPublica, Business Insider, USA Today, Insider.com, BU Today, and Forbes.com. Later in the show, stay tuned for our main event, where we dive into and interview the article, The Great White Heist. Peace. 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 This week in our personality piece, I'm going to pose a question that forces us to have personalities. We're, we're back. <laughs> okay, what questions do you have for us this week? Why are we still using the lesser of the two evils as a voting strategy? Um, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we're not? It's being imposed upon us by the powers that be. Okay. Uh, we can mark its beginnings at any time. Um, uh, we can say the League of Women, Women Voters, when they were prevented uh, by the re- cooperation between the Republicans and Democrats, to not allow them to have reign over who gets to uh, uh, present ideas to the American people. Uh, we can begin it at Clinton's uh, sellout of the uh, uh, black, white, somewhat coalition uh, to uh, 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 finance capital and uh, the, oh man, I can't remember the name of those people. When Clinton sold out the Democratic Leadership uh, Party to the Democratic Leadership Council, they virtually solidified the hierarchy or the elite, white elites among the Democratic Party uh, uh, to Silicon Valley interest and to finance capital interest. And over time, they merged with old oil interests, which were capital intensive to the Republican Party. And therefore, you had what I call a unification of white elites that the Democratic Party ultimately bowed down to. And because of that, our elections have been more lesser of two evil in nature. And therefore, uh, Mr. Barack Obama is helpful in explaining to some people uh, his strategy once confronted for being too socialist. And his response was, if you look at my policies, you'd see that they were moderate Republican. And when I tell people that, especially those who've drunk in the Obama laid, uh, they are absolutely befuddled by the fact that he admits that based on 1980 standards, he is and his policies were moderate Republican, which means that's how far the spectrum of politics has shifted because, back to the original question, because the population has been subjugated into the context or ideas of voting through the lesser of two evils. That happens over time. And I understand, you know, people are put into this position, Mm -hmm. but once you're it's not it's not a position that you have to accept exactly. in a sense, for example a lot of the arguments that you or i see on facebook if you don't want trump who else are you going to vote for mm-hmm. well plenty of candidates that are running for president exactly check out their platforms there's the green party there's what's that other party oh, there's the people's party that's emerging yeah there, there's parties there and there's um there's the poor people's party that i voted for instead of clinton there are absolute options that you do not have to um, vote for the lesser of evil. I know it, it looks like you have to and you feel like you're forced, but because you are so married to the Democratic Party and because majority of black ADOS vote Democrat, 
then I can see where they think that they only have this option. Well, it's 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 you know it's been done since the Civil War, um, before even before the Civil War. It, it was to maintain control. You limit options to just two parties, and always send the message. Well, another party it just can't get things done. Well. The reality is once people realize they're not getting enough and we keep redoing history because we fail to realize this uh, and I could explain reasons why, but mm -hmm. uh, the women's movement to even the uh, ending of slavery were, were, were drummed into American reality because of outside third party interests mm -hmm. uh, so that either of the two parties gave in to those interests so that they would not expand to a third party interest and they could guarantee more so a definite win. So one of the reasons why we don't have health care for everybody today is because we have not done that effectively. We haven't started a party that has a major platform that gathers enough attention, and that's the key word, especially post 60s, that uh, gets enough of the population behind it that forces the uh, leadership of either party to basically take it on. What they've been doing and the white domination racist media has been effective in doing is getting people to so hate socialism, to so hate communism, to so hate, I mean, that's why they want another uh, Cold Cold War era to come back. Um, they're doing that because it, it regiments the minds of the masses to either or thinking, black or white thinking. So when I've challenged uh, the understanding of COVID, for example, and I never say that it doesn't exist, but because I go against what we're told about it, people go ahead and say, well, you must be against the whole thing, therefore you're a conspiracy theorist. They, they just go into areas that don't think because their minds have been regimented into either or thinking. Mm -hmm. So we don't think that it's uh, doable to go beyond the lesser of two evils. We are consigned to the idea, how they enforce it is uh, a horse race, how they can sign us into that thought is that you've got the history of the Republicans and they're being Democrats and everybody being used to that. You've got uh, the polls since the 1980s and Reagan and Reagan's rise. You've got the polls and, and cities and states not allowing and making it harder for third parties. And I announced in the beginning how they got the League of Women Voters out of offering a platform for outside people to, to even speak. And even that was regimented, but it got tightened even further. So what you have after years and you go back to Greece or Rome, it's the same thing. The more the population is given and forced into either or or lesser of two evil alternatives, the spectrum of the politics shifts towards power. And today's power has been in and has always been to some degree, but greater intensified through the political process into the arms of conservative white elites and their interest. Therefore, Barack Obama was accurate. If he was judged in 1980 standards, his policies that he actually advocated for, didn't have to fight Republicans for or not, would have been judged moderate and or Republican. And he wasn't in front of black groups saying, I'm advocating for Republicans, stop complaining. <laughs> he just said, stop complaining and put on your shoes and get out there and do the work to force me basically, which didn't mean anything, especially when he sent people out at, at the Occupy movement and cracked heads. I mean, he was a white elite uh, racist dream in terms of leadership and people, mm -hmm. especially our people just don't want to face that because he led by way of his lineage and I'll never stop saying that. Yeah, and you you mentioned and you know and I noticed that you don't give a hard uh, stance on covid that information that you provide, you leave it up to the people, to, you know, go do your research, find out what's going on. But and like you said, a lot of times people think that criticism is against your means that you're against something. Yeah. And really and that it, that can include your political exactly um, parties that could you know your political candidates if you're criticizing them even if i'm saying obama criticizing obama it's the reason why it criticism is needed because you you're holding these people accountable you're holding these um political system mm -hmm. accountable for your life and your well-being your community's life and well-being and so if criticism means you're against the, is against it, that means that you're against what your community needs. Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't think that is, and it ain't never, it's never been a fair assessment. It, it, it increased because you, you know, we weren't allowed to criticize as a black community. We weren't yes. allowed to criticize the Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Like you said, he obviously was, had policies that were against what the black community need. 
Therefore, if we're criticizing, then we're criticizing, we're against them. And th three things were, were done to erect that. I could name more, but we know them. As soon as I say them, you're going to know it. In order to erect and regiment people's minds into either or thinking, giving people the feeling that they have to choose one or the other mm -hmm. and therefore consigned to the fact of lesser of two evils is respectability politics that mm -hmm. regimented people's minds yep. celebrity status or uh, mm -hmm. identity politics is just another way of saying celebrity mm -hmm. and the third one uh, was you know basically who has the money to present ideas and that is uh, through uh, marketing and and matter of fact Obama's uh, first run for the presidency for the ability of advertising. And as we said on this program a few months ago, that advertising stemmed from the word propaganda, which, you know, we don't know nowadays because we only think 10 to 20 years around our circumference of our lives, but uh, it's propaganda. And he, his propaganda won an award for advertising slash propaganda. So that was another way of regimenting people's minds. So they stole the, they told the storybook idea of his meeting Michelle without saying that they worked at a law firm that specialized in gentrifying areas of Chicago, which mm -hmm. forced in poor areas, particularly gang areas, into conflicting gang areas. And therefore, you got the violence that you have to some degree, still not number one, in Chicago with Obama and his wife knowing exactly what was the root of that problem. And so, but to criticize that against all that propaganda about their beautiful love story well and, you must was, be against black love ex okay. there, there you go i was i was accused of that but wow. i said by just trying to tell people what was going on at the at the, the firm mm -hmm. and therefore giving an indication as to what type of policy what type of president he would be and people you just mess up the story you don't believe in black love oh you mm -hmm. just must be a swirler i mean all kinds of accusations came mm -hmm. instead of dealing with the realities that i gave and that and that's meant that the population's minds were regimented yeah, I don't think people even you mentioned it was the first time I heard that the law firm that the law firm that they work for uh, was gentrifying her her position as that partner there that he was that junior partner coming in and she gave the brother a chance. Mm -hmm. She oversaw those types of activities at the law firm. Sister girl, <laughs> sister girl, Michelle. <laughs> Out here gentrifying our neighborhoods. So it's it's absolutely insane. But we don't know that. What we what we do know is the love story. They even made a movie off of it to yep. solidify this idea. Mm -hmm. And they did it after, you know, his uh, being in the White House to solidify the idea that you can have this sort of dream story boat life too. Mm -hmm. You can marry someone who has political aspirations and, and get there within a span of 10 years, which, you know, beats all kinds of records. So then you got to ask, how was he able to beat all those kinds of records? Because the, the his lineage helped him to get through doors that our lineage, ADOS lineage, would never allow us to get through. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and people don't want to have that discussion. No. Nope. Then you're down in a brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you're a voter and you feel like you're cornered into having to vote for the lesser of the two evils, we implore you to look elsewhere. And I have to also say one more thing. The uh, Princeton study, mm -hmm. it determined that by 2014, more than likely it was taking place sooner, we no longer have an operative representative democracy. It's over. They said, as of 2014, we have a functioning oligarchy with fascistic tendencies. Now that was on Obama's watch, mm -hmm. and that was as a result of his creating more white millionaires, helping more white elites gather more wealth and therefore power and influence in Washington. So by 2014, that was determined. And so that by the, the long-term lesson of voting decade after decade for the lesser of two evils shifts the political spectrum and helps to concentrate power among the already powerful so much so that we no longer have a functioning democracy and no one talks about that it's out of people's minds you tell people about that they don't believe you because you get the message all you have to do is vote all you have to and again all that is done to that's the fourth point regiment people's mind that believing that this is normal it's not normal we're functioning in a hostile environment continually now in our face given uh, lesser of two evil ideas mm -hmm. and where the reality is especially because we're bottom class whoever gets there we lose mm. we're already lost especially because of the Obama 
thing, but it's not just him. He just accelerated it more because his image and celebrity allowed him to do what white elites of his lineage could not do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being me and hearing oligarchy mm -hmm. a lot in the videos I watch on YouTube and I just somehow right now had to uh, <laughs> Google what the heck does that mean? Because I don't think most people know what it is, it is, but the definition is a small group of people having control of a country, organization, or institution. The very thing we complain about Russia having, which they do, they have their oligarchs, we have ours. Just mm -hmm. like the Iranians have their mullahs that run, o run over the government, we have ours. Yes, we do. So if you do not want to vote for an oligarchy candidate, someone that a small group has chosen for you to vote for, there are other options, please. Voting down ballot is a key one. Yes, down ballot voting is Besides a Besides the personages strategy. or platform, there is your interest, which more in line mm -hmm. is in line with voting down ballot, which is why I loved it, the idea. Down ballot voting, meaning the top of the ticket, in this case, the choices be, they gave us that are bleh, vomit. right <laughs> the top of the ticket, which this election will be the president mm -hmm. and maybe the next election may be governor is the top of the ticket. But if the, if the top of the ticket is not a person that you feel that you can uh, side with, even though they're in your own party. So that case, this case will be Joe Biden. You then you vote down ballot. That means you vote for other races in the Democratic Party that you feel are, uh, you would like to lend your voices to. And if those still don't um, speak to what you, um, uh, or the person doesn't speak to who you would like to vote for, then there's the issues. There you are go. there any issues on the ballot that you'd like to vote for? Uh, vote and then vote for that. A lot of people are issue only voters. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen that as an option. So yeah. if there is absolutely nothing for you on the ballot, it is your legal right and freedom to do whatever you feel and choose. And on that note. <laughs> Catch the fire. If you're ADOS, an ally or friend, we encourage you to connect with a local ADOS chapter and help change your local politics. Our ADOS Ohio chapter in Columbus meets every fourth Sunday of the month. For more information on the time and location, visit ADOSColumbus.org. You can also get more information on the ADOS movement, our politics, and the agenda. Please visit ADOS101.com. In today's rapid news reports, we have some articles that you may have missed, all in some way affect you and your ADOS life. Up first, we have... Black Pastor asks Trump, when has America been great for African Americans? From the publication Forbes.com, author and writer Cedric Big Set Thornton. According to ABC News, President Trump was given the chance to take questions from uncommitted voters in a 90-minute special from the battleground state of Pennsylvania. One interesting moment of the town hall occurred when a black pastor, Carl Day, questioned Trump regarding his campaign slogan, Make America Great Again. You've coined the phrase, Make America Great Again, said Day. Raw Story reported, when has America been great for African Americans in the ghetto of America? Are you aware of how tone deaf that comes off to African American communities? Trump sidestepped the question by responding, well, I can say this, we have tremendous African American support. You probably have seen it in the polls. We're doing extremely well with African American, Hispanic American at levels that you've rarely seen a Republican have. I graded this article okay. And up next. From the publication, Business Insider, entitled, Racism Has Cost Black Americans 70 Trillion Since the Start of Slavery. Here's how that cost breaks down. Tagline, today, he says, the black tax is perpetuated by discrimination. Black people are hired less frequently, paid less, and have less access to wealth building tools like affordable mortgages. Written by Mariette Williams. Black Americans face a staggering wealth gap the most recent statistics show that in 2016, a typical middle-class white family in the United States had $149,703 in accumulated wealth, while a middle-class black family had only $13,024, meaning black families have 8.6% of the wealth of white families. According to Sean Rochester, author of The Black Tax, The Cost of Being Black in America, 
the cause of this gap can be traced back to slavery. For centuries, black Americans have been left out of government programs designed to help citizens build wealth. In 1863, black Americans were denied access to the Homestead Act, which promised 160 acres of land to citizens in exchange for a small fee and five years of cultivating the land. Over 70 years, 1.6 million mostly white homesteaders claimed 270 million acres, about 10% of U.S. land, valued at 1.6 trillion. Each of these government programs designed to help Americans build wealth was withheld from black people, causing each generation to fall further behind. But even when black people have tried to start their own businesses and networks to create wealth, their progress has been blocked or dismantled, often violently. I graded this uh, story good. White wealth building because they worked hard is nothing but a big white lie. And next. For black Americans, college degrees aren't about catching up. They're a matter of survival. Tagline. The Myth of Higher Education as a Great Equalizer. Publication, the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. Author and writer, Nika D. Denny. As stated in the eye-opening report, What We Get Wrong About Closing the Racial Wealth Gap, the authors explain on average a black household with a college-educated head has less wealth than a white family whose head did not even attain a high school diploma. You read that correctly. The median net worth for black families with a college degree is $70,219, while it is 12,000 higher at $82,968 for a white household with less than a high school education. Black people's low wealth levels have two significant implications for higher education. Black students tend to take on more student loan debt than their white counterparts and black graduates are more likely to default on their student loan payments. Not only are black students more likely to finance their education with student loans, but they also have more student loan debt than their white peers. I graded this article good. And up next. From the publication USA Today entitled Vitamin C by IV and an FBI Raid. How hope rather than proof sent the antioxidant sales soaring during COVID-19. Written by Brent Schrodenborer. Wearing face masks and protective Tyvek suits with yellow boots, FBI investigators recently raided a medical building in Metro Detroit to gather evidence about an alleged fake treatment being sold for COVID-19. It looked like a drug bust. Authorities sealed off the building's entrance, carried away boxes, and enlisted local police to secure the area. But this wasn't a rogue lab getting seized for illicit substances. In this case, agents were investigating a suspected scheme involving an essential nutrient found in orange juice, broccoli, and strawberries, vitamin C, otherwise known as ascorbic acid. This powerful antioxidant has become the subject of faith, controversy, and even frequent government crackdowns during the pandemic. It's also become more popular than ever benefiting from religious-like claims and beliefs about its effectiveness against COVID-19, despite not even having the power to cure the common cold. I graded this article good. When FBI started raiding businesses in April and again in July, businesses who were holding and selling high doses of intravenous vitamin C, I definitely knew something was up. I had a friend who had rectal cancer who bounced back and is still alive due to the high dose intravenous vitamin C she received. Please note, Dr. Fauci was silent when all these busts were going on. And next. POV. It's time for reparations and transitional justice for African Americans. Tagline, the country needs truth telling and acceptance of our moral, legal, political, and sociocultural responsibilities. From the publication BU Today, author and writer Joyce Hope Scott. Despite myths of post-racial society as a result of many positive social transformations, we are today again forced to examine our inheritance of America's great sin, slavery and its subsequent legacies of Jim Crow segregation, systemic racism, and dispossession of African Americans. 
The lens of iPhones, nightly reports by the media, the Black Lives Matter movement, protest against extrajudicial powers of the police, and the murder of black people with impunity are exposing the fragile underbelly of this society. And what we see is the stark reality of structural racism and visceral inequality. It is time for truth telling and acceptance of our moral, legal, political, and social cultural responsibilities. In essence, another opportunity to acknowledge and make right the deep wrong of shadow slavery and its destructive aftermath for black people in our entire society. This is an unpopular subject and Professor Kofi Ini Idaho of the University of Ghana noted it's best when he remarked that slavery is like a wound in the belly over which scar tissue has grown. Such a wound is likely to destroy you if it is not opened up and cleaned of its infection. For us in the United States, it lies hidden under the cover of historical amnesia. I graded this article good. Up next. From the publication Insider.com, entitled, Fauci says that he takes vitamin D and C supplements and that they can lessen your susceptibility to infection. Tagline, there's good science behind his recommendation with plenty of evidence that being deficient in either nutrient can make you more susceptible to infection. Written by Gabby Landsberg. Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, gave an Instagram live interview with the actress Jennifer Gardner on Thursday, in which he specifically suggested taking vitamin D and C supplements and said he took them himself. If you're deficient in vitamin D, that does have an impact on your susceptibility to infection. I would not mind recommending, and I do it myself taking vitamin D supplements, he said. The other vitamin that people take is vitamin C because it's a good antioxidant. So if people want to take a gram or so of vitamin C, that would be fine. There's a large body of research supporting Fauci's recommendations. Studies suggest vitamin D and C are your best bet for supplementing immune health. However, Many of the other products sold for this purpose are useless or worse. I graded this story fair. A clear indication that the public was being misled through the omission of messages that could have informed the public in ways we could have strengthened our immune systems. Yet from April through July, the FBI was busting businesses that were providing these vitamins high dose. Now Fauci is taking grams orally in the comfort of his own home in order to strengthen his immune system. Why was he not advising this for the public? Why was he remaining silent as businesses providing high dose intravenous vitamin C were being raided by the FBI? Why was he not telling the public all this from the beginning? Due to higher levels of melanin, black people are usually vitamin D deficient. Throughout all of our disproportionate deaths, Dr. Fauci was silent, but was taking vitamin D himself. Ask these types of questions. Protest for an investigation. Demand answers. And next. Is there a legal basis for reparations? Ask the lawyer. From the publication Press Telegram, author and writer Ron Sokol. Question to the lawyer. With all the protests about social injustice in our country now, one argument being made is that reparations should be paid for slavery. Is there a legal basis for that? Asks FC Tarzana. Bills have been introduced over the years to create a commission to study and evaluate reparation proposals related to African Americans. One possible basis for reparation is the legal theory of unjust enrichment, which seeks to disgorge ill-gotten gains and is rooted in justice and equity. Bottom line, it will take an act of Congress for reparations to be approved. I graded this article a waste of time. Why? Because just like a lawyer, he did not answer the question. The question was, is there a legal basis for reparations? And up next. From the publication ProPublica, entitled, Climate Change Will Force a New American Migration. Tagline, wildfires rage in the West. Hurricanes batter the East. Droughts and floods wreak damage throughout the nation. Life has become increasingly untenable in the hardest hit areas. But if the people there move, where will everyone go? Written by Abraham Lustgarden. 
The sense that money and technology can overcome nature has emboldened Americans. Where money and technology fall, though, it inevitably falls to government policies and government subsidies to pick up the slack. Perhaps no market force has proved more influential and more misguided than the nation's property insurance system. From state to state, readily available and affordable policies have made it attractive to buy or replace homes even where they are at high risk of disasters, systematically obscuring the reality of the climate threat and fooling many Americans into thinking that their decisions are safer than they actually are. Even where insurers have tried to withdraw policies or raise rates to reduce climate-related liabilities, state regulators have forced them to provide affordable coverage anyway, simply subsidizing the cost of underwriting such a risky policy or, in some cases, offering it themselves. The regulations, called fair access to insurance requirements, are justified by developers and local politicians alike as economic lifeboats of last resort in regions where climate change threatens to interrupt economic growth. I graded this report fair. Good that the writer identifies the foolhardy nature of white America's use of capitalism is pitted against nature itself. Poor and that by using phrases like money and technology can overcome nature has emboldened Americans. It is obvious it isn't Americans, it is overwhelmingly wealthy white Americans' appetite for preferential treatment, not against fellow non-white human beings, but Mother Nature itself. Also, this article identifies clearly how the black ADOS poor, yet he fails to illustrate what that will look like, so I will do it for you here. Eventually, black ADOS, you must be prepared to be reintroduced to Katrina's aftermath yet on a national scale, where state and national services will be so overstretched that no one will ever be able to come to your rescue. And next. How the Black Vote Became a Monolith. From the publication New York Times, author and writer Theodore R. Johnson. In the autumn of 2008, just a few weeks after my 33rd birthday, I cast a ballot for the first time. Up to that point, serving in the military seemed like more than sufficient civic engagement and provided a ready excuse for voluntarily opting out of several elections. I was an officer who'd spent more than a decade in the Navy and not a second in a voting booth. This apathy does not run in the blood. My parents are products of the civil rights era in the Jim Crow South and as such religiously exercised their hard won right to vote. In my formative years, the basic disposition of the house politics pressed together progressive demands for racial equality with black conservatism of Marathon Church. I graded this article good. I remember tweeting this response after black Twitter was upset at Joe Biden for saying Latinos had more diversity unlike the black community. People raised that. How dare he say that? The black community is not a monolith. Well. You can't keep voting for the same people and party and not be a monolith. You are voting as a monolith. We all may act differently, but we vote the same tired way every election. You deserve the politics and the politicians you vote for. Yes, you are a voting monolith. And up next. From the publication, San Francisco Chronicle, entitled, We're Witnessing a Battle Over America. Equality versus White Supremacy. Writer Otis R. Taylor Jr. Counter protesters would like for the American public to think they're some kind of uncaped heroes rushing in to defend a community under siege. But that's not what they're defending. Intolerance and hatred is what these armed counter protesters are defending. We're witnessing a battle over America. One side is fighting for equality and all races to be treated equally and fairly. The other side is fighting for white supremacy, and they have a president in the White House and, it seems, police on their side. Jack Glazier, a UC Berkeley professor and social psychologist who researches stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination, told me there's a double standard for what police consider to be threatening. One of the causes is just the automatic stereotypes that police and other people have associated black people with crime and weapons and violence. Glazier said, 
There's also this element of dehumanization where people generally see people of other races and ethnicities as less human. And that's especially so with white people in how they regard black people. I graded this story good. And that's it for this week's Rapid News. All articles featured will be posted in our Facebook group and in the show notes on our website. We want to take the time to give our friends and listeners a shout out. Thank you for clicking that subscribe button and for liking and sharing the podcast. You can also continue supporting the show by joining our Patreon, where you can receive exclusive content and promotional items for as little as $3 a month. Sponsoring the show will ensure that we can continue to bring you the news and information important to your ADOS life. So head on over and join us at patreon.com slash articles of ADOS. Time now for the main, main, main event. In this week's main event, we will interview the article, The Great White Heist, from the publication The Black Agenda Report, author and writer Michael Harriet. I will ask the questions and Daewoo will give the answers. Thank you for meeting with us, Mr. Harriet. Can you begin with the story you used to frame your article so we can see from your thesis regarding the death from the black community. In 1948, when only 16 states in America had outlawed segregated public schools, black parents in the tiny hamlet of Somerton, South Carolina, where three out of every four residents were black, finally got tired of being robbed by white people. Their children were mostly just tired. Every day, young Somertonians maneuvered through one obstacle course after another, only to be rewarded with an inferior education. If the children were lucky, they walked as far as nine miles to attend one of the segregated schools in Clarendon County's District 22. On other days, rain would force students as young as six years old to wade across a stream to attend school. Often, When the water was particularly high, someone would provide a raft to row their way across the Lake Marion Reservoir. When they arrived at school, they would have to chop wood for their unheated classrooms. If they arrived, sometimes a student would just drown on the way. Isn't that what rural life was like during that time? This may sound like a rough life for impoverished rural students, but Somerton was not a poor town. The vast majority of Somerton's black citizens were employed. Many owned businesses or worked at comparatively well-paying jobs in local factories. Their employers withheld federal, state, and local taxes from their paychecks, just like their white counterparts. Somerton's black residents were not exempt from paying property taxes, sales taxes, or any other assessment their government deemed necessary. Naturally, Black parents were outraged when they discovered the white children didn't have to make the same daily trek as their children because the district had purchased 33 buses to chauffeur them to school. Incensed, a group of parents begged Clarendon County School Superintendent R. W. Elliott for just one bus to serve the county's black students. He said no. Okay, I do see how the unequal treatment may have had deeper repercussions and needed to be challenged. It did. So Harry and Eliza Briggs, along with 20 other black families, contacted the NAACP and eventually filed Briggs v. Elliott, the first of five cases that would eventually be combined and become known as Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka. But even before their case dismantled the Supreme Court's separate but equal president, the parents of District 22 fully understood why their children lived this precariously treacherous existence. White people in the district were stealing their money, all of them. One thing Americans love to do is correct or punish people. Not so much when you are on the receiving end of that punishment, right? Punishing a thief is not justice. It is retribution. For justice to exist, the victim must be made whole and their losses must be repaid. The idea that justice and restitution are inextricably intertwined is a bedrock principle enshrined in American property law and federal statutes. Without restitution, there can be no justice. Almost every argument for reparations is anchored in the injustice and residual effects of slavery, and it is often challenged by predictably trite counterarguments. Let me guess, these are the usual excuses given as to why we can't give reparations. 
correct. For example, they say, slavery was so long ago, so few people owned slaves. What about the black people who owned slaves? That's how it was back then. How can you ask for reparations for something that was not a crime? You say different? I say just because enslaving and stealing labor from black people was perfectly legal prior to 1868, America should not get to ignore the calls for issuing dividends to the descendants of the people who supplied this nation with 246 years of free labor. Slavery, although treacherous, was only the beginning of America's theft. Slavery was just one small part of a loan that black people invested into America, for which we never reaped the dividends or the principal. At the center of this argument is how this country became and remained an economic superpower, due in large part to the contributions of black America's sweat equity and actual funds. Who benefited the most from that sweat equity? We often talk about the unpaid wages of slavery, but never talk about how free labor benefited even those who didn't own slaves. The cotton merchants made higher profits because they bought cotton cheaply. The shipbuilders, the textile industry, the international traders, the national defense, and every free person in America benefited from this free labor that propped up the entire national economy. But that was only a drop in the bucket when it comes to what America owes in reparations. Let's get right into the heart of the article. You say if the 14th Amendment was meant to be a reset button that offered the American dream to the millions of black hostages whose involuntary sweat equity built this country into a superpower, then the time since July 9th, 1868 can only be described as a period of illegal theft. On that day, the Constitution of the United States was officially amended for the 14th time, declaring, in part, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Based on the deprivation that was never ending, I would say upon the 14th Amendment being ratified, America's treatment of black people was unconstitutional. The unconstitutional burgling of black America actually began when slavery ended. If this wholly immoral but wildly successful experiment in venture capitalism called the United States was founded on July 4th, 1776, then the startup capital of slavery only served as seed money for the first 89 years. However, the fantasy that we call the American dream isn't solely funded by decency, hard work, or American exceptionalism. It comes from theft. Could this have contributed to the current racial wealth gap? According to the Brookings Institute, in 2016, the average white family's median wealth was $171,000, while the median wealth of a typical black family was around $17,000. The reason for this staggering wealth disparity is not just due to slavery, Jim Crow, or even America's unique form of racism. Since the moment the 14th Amendment was ratified, America has been engaged in a Robin Hood-like heist. But instead of taking from the rich and giving to the poor, the United States has circumvented the 14th Amendment by stealing black America's wealth and giving it to white people. Every white person in America, rich or poor, liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican, has benefited from stolen goods that were hijacked from black America. Yes, all white people. All white people? Can you elaborate? The white Summertonians who rode on school buses bought in part with the taxes paid by black residents whose children crossed a river of racism on foot is a perfect example. Those white children arrived at school well rested and ready to learn while their black counterparts endured inequalities laid out in the initial Briggs v. Elliott complaint, including unhealthy and inadequate facilities, an insufficient number of teachers and classroom space and inadequate resources. The black parents were disproportionately paying for white students beautiful new schools and the comfort in which they engaged in learning. And this phenomenon 
wasn't unique to Somerton. Even though South Carolina was 40% black in 1948 statewide. What were the differences between the white and black schools? Black schools were worth 12.9 million, while white schools were worth 68.4 million. If those white students succeeded in their resource-filled schools, they could go on to one or more than a dozen public institutions of higher learning in South Carolina. However, if the black graduates wanted to attend a state college because of state segregation laws, there was only one choice, South Carolina State College, the only public black college in the state. This detail wouldn't be important except for three important facts about the taxpayers whose money actually funded South Carolina's white only state post-secondary schools and the one historically black college post-emancipation. South Carolina taxpayers paid for seven whites-only colleges. South Carolina taxpayers paid for zero black colleges. South Carolina State University was a land-grant college, which meant it was funded with federal money after the Civil War. The majority of South Carolina taxpayers were black, according to U.S. Census workers. Most of the school age population, taxpayers, and wage earners in the Palmetto State were black. Every black person in South Carolina was being robbed. Every white person in South Carolina benefited from that stolen property. Speaking of college, didn't the military discriminate against black veterans with the GI Bill? The theft of black wealth wasn't just limited to education or just taking place. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, commonly known as the GI Bill. The law offered government-guaranteed home loans and paid tuition costs for World War II veterans, unless you were black. In the book, When Affirmative Action Was White, Ira Katzen Nelson notes that of the 67,000 mortgages approved under the GI Bill in New York and New Jersey, Fewer than 100 of the home buying veterans was not white. Were the veterans able to attend at least HBCUs? When it came to college loans, even colleges in the North rejected black veterans. And because historically black colleges and universities were packed to the gills with students who couldn't attend white schools in the South, by 1946, only 20% of the former black soldiers who applied for education benefits had enrolled in college, according to Hillary Herbold in the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education. Though Congress granted all soldiers the same benefits, theoretically, writes Herbold, the segregationist principles of almost every institution of higher learning effectively disbarred a huge proportion of black veterans from earning a college degree. Many of the GI Bill's home loan denials were based on a government policy that may be the most important contributor to the racial wealth gap redlining. Death through home ownership? You make it seem as this was just as worse than the GI Bill. If racism is the tool with which white America tunneled under the 14th Amendment and plundered the metaphorical bank of black America, then redlining is the blueprints to the vault. In the mid-1930s, to lift America out of the Great Depression, The New Deal created huge economic programs sponsored by the federal government. The government mechanized farms, funded businesses, gave out jobs to any able-bodied American, built suburbs, and created a minimum wage. The new Social Security Administration, SSA, gave people financial security in their old age. The Works Progress Administration, WPA, gave people jobs. The Homeowners Loan Corporation, HOLC, refinanced mortgages at low interest rates to prevent foreclosures. These programs saved America, did it not? The progressive legislation was a massive investment in America's future and, although it was costly, it lifted an entire country out of poverty. And more than any other group of legislation in American history, the jobs, social programs, and guaranteed loans created by the New Deal are responsible for building what we now call the middle class. There was only one problem. Black people, overwhelmingly, were not included. For those that do not recognize the impact of it, how did redlining work? To ensure that these guaranteed mortgages were not risky, the HOLC created color-coded 
residential security maps of 239 cities. The maps essentially highlighted the neighborhoods that were good investments versus neighborhoods that were poor investments. The risky neighborhoods were highlighted in red, including every one of the 239 cities, black neighborhoods. So by and large, black people were discriminated against and forced to live in segregated and poor neighborhoods only for it to be used as a way to not climb into the middle class. Yes, banks began using these maps for all home purchases and refinancing. Because of this, as generations of Americans lifted themselves out of poverty, black people could not take part in America's primary driver of wealth, home ownership. Redlining was outlawed in 1968 by the Fair Housing Act, but it still affects almost every economic aspect of black communities to this day. Nearly every calculatable effect of institutional inequality can be traced back to this 85-year-old government policy. With this redlining, you believe devaluing the neighborhoods and devaluing the homes was theft? Redlining explains why researchers at the Brookings Institute found that homes in neighborhoods where the population is majority black are valued, on average, 48,000 less than homes in white neighborhoods. The result is a 156 billion cumulative loss in black owned property values, even when the white neighborhoods have the same amenities, crime rates and resources as the black neighborhoods. This is a complete cycle of economic terrorism, I would say. According to the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, about 36 percent of education funding comes from local property taxes. These lower home values, which are the direct result of redlining, mean that schools in black neighborhoods receive less funding. Therefore, redlining is why eBuild reports that majority white school districts receive 2,226 more per student than non-white districts, resulting in a theft of $23 billion. Even though the Fair Housing Act was implemented, did it have any impact in housing and lending discrimination or direct benefits to the people in these red line areas? Residents who live in formerly red line areas pay higher interest rates and are denied mortgages more often than whites with the same credit and income, according to reporting by the Center of Investigative Journalism. People in red line areas pay higher auto insurance rates, pay more for fresh food, have less access to medical care, pay higher interest rates on loans, receive more parking violations, pay higher bail amounts, and wait longer to vote. So another act, another amendment, another law allowed to be ignored, and black Americans still experiencing theft from the poor and disenfranchised? The white people who built their fortunes from low interest loans, cheap food, and high home values don't pay more taxes. Yet they are benefiting from current and past policies that have taken money from black taxpayers and handed it over to whites. I thought it was through pulling up their bootstraps, obviously not the case. Perhaps there is someone with an adding machine powerful enough to calculate the immense value of the stolen wealth. It would be interesting to compare the towering stack of dollars that represent the stolen labor of enslaved Africans with the black wealth that has been embezzled over the past 152 years. We invested our money on the ground floor of this nation with literal sweat equity, and we deserve a return on our investment. In the end, not only are the slave owners complicit, everyone was. Correct? Centering the reparations conversation on slavery absolves the non-slave-holding thieves who are still walking around with our dividends in their pockets. Justice demands restitution and until there are reparations, there can be no justice. Until there are reparations, anyone who pledges their allegiance to the flag that stands for a country with liberty and justice for all is a liar and a thief. Well, that completes this interview. Michael Harriet is a senior writer at TheRoot.com covering the intersection of race, politics, and culture. His book, Black AF History, will be released in the spring of 2021. As always, listeners, you can get the link to this full article on our website in this week's show notes. Coming up, we have a commentary on this article. Did we like it? Did we hate it? Stay tuned.
we want to take the time to give our friends and listeners a shout out. Thank you for clicking that subscribe button and for liking and sharing the podcast. You can also continue supporting the show by joining our Patreon, where you can receive exclusive content and promotional items for as little as $3 a month. Sponsoring the show will ensure that we can continue to bring you the news and information important to your ADOS life. So head on over and join us at patreon.com slash articles of ADOS. All right, so what do we think of this week's article? Um, pretty good. Um, not really used to getting this quality of work from the root.com, to be honest. <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah, I, I chose it uh, because not many articles are, when they speak on reparations, speak to the death of what um, those that were enslaved and those that were not, um, and how not only did the slave owners benefit but all Americans benefited because a lot of people like to say, hmm. well, I didn't own any slaves. My hmm. family didn't own any slaves. Y- your family didn't have to own slaves. The fact that the free labor from the slaves created an economic security in America for your family to grow means you benefited. Mm-hmm. So I liked how this article explained that, that cause you know, I didn't, I never thought about, okay, um, everybody, everybody benefited. I liked how he um, also um, framed the article so that people could see death isn't just you walking up to somebody with a gun in your hand saying, exactly. give me your money. It is through taxes, through property taxes, it's through sales taxes that you're paying to the state and the state is funneling that only to the white families. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of different ways that you can steal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, this goes to speak to how well he did on that portion of his work. I think Claude Anderson for me, and of course, it's not an exact comparison because Claude Anderson had a book, whole book to do it, where he really delineated how slavery was a major payoff to 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 white people, uh, particularly the elites, but definitely to all people from Europe coming in and wanting to do what you said earlier. They didn't come here because of just because of persecution, which was going on in Europe. They came here to to, to make their mark and, and make wealth mm-hmm. off the backs of the slaves who were at the bottom, the enslaved Africans who were at the bottom. Well, they can also take that same type of ingenuity to, 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 to basically rip people off. And they've chosen our group to be the ones that will generate wealth not only on the slave foundation, but also in so-called freedom so that we're living our lives, working and paying our taxes and they're utilizing the economic system. They're using the retail system. They're using the tax system to undergird ongoing theft of our labor. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I often say that slavery never really ended. It merely mutated. And I believe if we had more of that mentality, we'd have more ADOS members and we'd have more drives of other people realizing this. And and I've said this before, too, on on, on our program, 16 year old on average white uh, girls in that were called factory girls in Boston said the had the same insight. There's very little difference between us and the enslaved Africans. Of course, I'm saying it from the other perspective where we get paid, but we only get paid enough just to perform for the fat cats. Well, that completes the commentary on this article. As always, check back next week to see what we think of our main event. We are coming to get our check. There you have it, another week, another show. Thanks for joining us on the Articles of ADOS podcast. Make sure to visit our website, articlesofados.com, where you can join our mailing list and see the show notes for today's episode. Be sure to tune in next Friday for a new episode of Undiscussed News You May Have Missed. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, send us an email to listeners at articlesofados.com. And remember, you can catch us live at 10 a.m. every Friday on WCRS 92.7 and 98.3 here in Columbus, Ohio. Also head over to our Patreon page to support the podcast as we give you weekly news and information important to our community. Until next time, family, stay safe and stay strong. Peace. We're coming.